Let me go ahead then, uh, since I've already uh, said some of this stuff uh, twice and don't want to take up too much time, introduce our speaker, Dr. Jay Chapman, who is assistant professor um, with a specialty in crustal dynamics at the University of Wyoming. So uh, Jay has a bachelor's in geology from the College of William & Mary, master's from the University of Texas, El Paso, and PhD in geosciences from the University of Arizona. Um, his research uh, focus is on the tectonics of convergent orogenic systems and the evolution of continent, continent, the continental lithosphere. Basically think about um, the area around us here we live in a convergent margin, and that's the kind of thing that, uh, that Jay studies. Uh, typical research projects of his integrate field, analytical, and numerical methods. And he uh, works actively to recruit, recruit students uh, at the university from all levels, both undergraduate, graduate, and postdoc as well. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and ask Jay to step up to the computer here. Hopefully, you will be able to hear him. <laughs> Yay. Hey, thank you. This is my first time giving a talk in a year and a half or so in person as well. So I'm excited to see faces and not screens. If I get this to work. Okay, I think it's I think it's working. All right, well, thanks so much for having me. So it's a different talk than was on advertised. So I had the talk that I'd, I'd given before a few times, and then uh, a colleague of mine and some students we just published a paper uh, last month on a different topic, and it got picked up in the sort of local press a little bit. So John emailed me, and he's like, "Hey, give us the new give us the new stuff. Don't give us the uh, the, the old stuff." So anyway, so this is the first talk I'll be public talk I'll be giving on this, this other topic as well. So the title of the talk, the title of the paper is the North American Cordilleran and a Tectic Belt. So Cordilleran, Spanish word, it's a diminutive form of cord or rope. It was developed for the Andes. So it describes sort of the mountain chains like cords in the Andes. It was also adopted for the North America, for the, for the US. Anatectic is a, uh, from the Greek word anatexis, which means to melt or thaw. And so what this uh, thing I'm studying or thing we're, we're investigating has to do with these partial melting of these rocks within the North American Cordillera, which I will we'll talk a little bit more about for you guys as well. Let me adjust the presenter view real quick. Uh, this, this picture here is from the Ruby Mountains, East Humboldt Mountains in, in Nevada, which is one of the field, field sites. It's a very nice location. Um, I guess before I get into that. Um, yeah, so as John mentioned, my research is, focuses on these convergent margins, and the one we live in is a Cordilleran margin. So even though it sort of describes the, the mountain chains in geology, Cordillera has come to mean a margin that's an ocean continent subduction system. So you can have convergent margins where it's continent, continent colliding. This would be like India and Asia and the Himalayas. And here we have an ocean continent subduction. So oceanic plates subducting beneath North America in our case. And that gave rise to most of the, the mountains here. So traditionally when plate tectonics was conceived in the 1960s, plates were thought to be very rigid. So the idea is that's why they're called plates. They're thought to be these hard rigid things and they move around and slide past each other and run into each other. And this is sort of a classic plate tectonics map. But now our view of plates is a little bit different. Instead of being rigid, we tend to think of them as being squishy. So this is an elevation map of North America. You can see all the high topography in the western half of North America. So all of that high topography, that's the North American Cordillera, stretching from Alaska down into to Mexico, and then it picks up again in South America, South American Cordillera. So all of this high topography, all these mountains, are mainly related to this history of the margin as this ocean continent subduction, uh, subduction system. Um, and what I really love about it is this huge complex region, but it's all connected somehow. So it's all made up of these components, these different things that link up with one another. 
And it's not just a you know random mountain here and a random mountain here, that it's all, all related. So mountains we see in California related to the mountains we see here in Wyoming. Same thing, Colorado, Nevada, wherever you go, you can start to put together these pieces of the, the picture. And so a lot of what I do is try to understand these different components of this that we call an orogenic system. So origin, mountain building, orogeny, mountain building events. So orogenic system is sort of a, a mountain system. So understanding the whole, whole process. And it's made up of these different parts, or I usually call them components. So starting from sort of west to east, the classic components would be something like a trench, an accretionary complex, we're scraping sediments off the down going plate. We have things like four arcs, this would be like the Great Valley in California, it would be sort of a four arc basin. We have the continental arc, so classically this is the Sierra Nevada, or it could be the peninsula ranges, Baffleth, uh, there's different places, I'll talk a little about those. Um, then we have uh, originic plateau, which would have been sort of like the Nevada region today. And then retroarch thrust belt, like the severe belt, Orland Basin, uh, Forland Uplift Frozen Storm Basin. So you don't need to worry about sort of the details, but there's lots of these different parts that are unique to all of the, the Cordillera and that connect, um, connect together. So there's many ways to get, you know, investigate the Cordillera, sort of avenues of research to get in there. The one I'm going to talk about today and one I've been involved with a lot is looking at magmatic rocks, looking at igneous rocks, looking at magmatism to try to understand the processes and how these mountains are built and what, what went on. So normally when people think of Cordilleran systems, Cordillan orogenic systems, uh, sort of Western United States, birth of these mountains, we think of continental arcs. So continental arcs are the magmatic rocks, the volcanic chains that form when the oceanic plate is subducting. So the way continental arcs work is the, they release water, it dehydrates off of the downgoing slab. This water lowers the melting point of the mantle. And then we start to create melts in the mantle and they make their way up to the crust and they can form uh, rocks like granites within the crust or they can erupt and form volcanoes at the surface. So the Sierra Nevada, places like Yosemite are our classic examples of ancient, the ancient continental arc that was in the Western US. We also have a modern continental arc, and that would be the Cascade Arc. So think about uh, Mount St. Helens, and Mount Shasta, and Mount Hood, and Mount Rainier. All of these are sort of the modern, modern arc. So we can see bits of the modern arc in the Pacific Northwest. We can also see remnants of an ancient arc in places like the Sierra Nevada um, to the south. Let's see my cursor. Can you see the cursor? No. Oh, there it is. Mm -hmm. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Let me see. I'm not sure how that. Okay. Okay. Now go to your window. Okay. So now full screen. What people are seeing? Okay. Now, yeah, it's it's right now on the Gotcha. <clears throat> You guys could gather around me here and look at my laptop screen. I'm so yeah, that's exactly what I'm getting. Yeah, the mic too. Yeah, because we're working. Okay. 
See the right stuff there? Okay. Oop. Oh yeah, let's see. Know what, John? You might be able to plug your laptop in. Yeah. So people can see a chair screen on TV here. Or your your computer. All right. Well, if you got it, just that cord will be a couple of Bingo. Okay. We did it. We did it. Sneak by the computers. Yeah. Okay. So, continental arcs are the classic sort of magmatic activity associated with subduction, Cordier and Cordier and margin. That's the main sort of magmatic. That's normally how we even identify that there was subduction in Earth's history, because we find continental arcs and these very specific types of igneous rocks associated with those. And things like Yosemite are the classic, classic examples. To the, my, you can see my cursor, I think. So this is the Peninsula Ranges batholith to the south, this is the Idaho batholith, this would be the Coast Mountains batholith to the north. So we have all these different uh, batholiths, which are these ancient, ancient arc records. I'm trying to advance. Oh, that works. So I'm going to give you sort of a, a very brief overview of the magmatic history of the Western U.S. during the sort of period when we had this this continental arc. So let me, I guess, let me go back a little bit. So these continental arcs existed in the Western U.S. from about the Triassic till about the Mid Cretaceous. So that's maybe let's say 250 million years ago to about 80 million years ago or 90 million years. So during that time, we had sort of a, a semi-stable continental arc sort of on the margin of the North American plate, basically where the Sierra Nevada was, where you see these orange, uh, these orange colors. And so it moved around a little bit, and there was some other things going on, but more or less in the same, same spot. And so that changed starting around 90 million years ago, when instead of having sort of normal angle subduction, which is sort of shown in this, this diagram down here, the subduction angle started to shallow. So it's instead of dipping, say, at 45 degrees, it started dipping at 10 degrees or 15 degrees. Or perhaps it was even flat. It was sort of sliding along the base of the crust. So that's what's sort of shown schematically in the top diagram here. It's this period of flat, we call it flat slab subduction. And the thinking for why this occurred is that we started subducting oceanic crust that was much more buoyant. And most researchers believe this related to an oceanic plateau so this has been like a large igneous province, something like Hawaii or Iceland today, where a lot of basalt was erupted and thickened, thickened the crust. And so we're subducting a lot of thick uh, basalts that's more buoyant, and it could have caused it, instead of just subduct down an angle, it sort of tried to ride along the, the base of the lithosphere. Um, but the important, well, also this gave rise to uh, this, this effects of this low angle subduction is the Laramide orogeny in the U.S., which you might have heard that name before. The name comes from Laramie, the Laramie Mountains, actually. Um, and all of, well, not all the mountains, but a lot of the mountains in Wyoming are related to this Laramie project. So the Wind River Range, the Bighorn Mountains, the Medicine Bow Mountains, the Laramie Range, these are all mountains that were created during the Laramie orogeny because of this low angle subduction. But that's not 
really the part of the story here. The main thing I'm interested in this talk is that as the slab shallowed, the region of magnetism moved inland, if that makes sense. Let me go back to the other one. So there's magnetism occurring above the, above the plate here. And it's occurring at a certain depth down in the earth where the water is starting to dehydrate from the slab and cause melting. So if the slab angle shallows, that depth is going to be further, further inland, if that makes sense. You guys follow that? You can say no if you don't. But anyway, so the idea is as the slab was shallowing, the position of magnetism started to move inward. And it moved really far away inward. At this latitude, it moved all the way out to the Black Hills. So I have a, a picture of Devil's Tower there. So Devil's Tower um, is around 45 million years old, I believe. Um, so this is during this time when the slab was shallowing and magnetism was starting to move to the east. Uh, in the southern part of the U.S., it moved all the way out to about Big Bend. Big Bend National Park has a series of volcanoes, which are also 35, 40 million years old. So we went from hell this magmatic activity on the coast in places like California, Oregon, and then moved inland all the way into eastern Wyoming, all the way into sort of central Texas, these, these areas. It started about 90 million years ago. So that's when a lot of the continental arcs like the Sierra Nevada start to shut down. And then it slowly moved east through time and it reached at max maximum extent in this sort of 45, 40 million year uh, window. So during that period, magnetism was marching eastward across North America. And so it's very bizarre to have magnetism in places like Eastern Wyoming or Central Texas, very, very far away from the plate margin. So we know there was something very unusual going on especially since we just had almost 200 million years of the arc staying relatively stationary. You know? a, a little bit different. There's a lot of magmatic activity on the Colorado Plateau, but a lot of that is slightly younger, which I'll talk about in just a second. And the reason why the Colorado Plateau has a high elevation is another mystery. And also related to the subduction story, possibly. Maybe we'll talk about it afterwards, but it's another very good story. Another, another talk. So the slab shallowed. The slab was called the Farallon plate. It was sort of a Paleo-Pacific plate at the time, um, you know, sort of riding along the base of the lithosphere, the base of the, base of the crust. And it reached its sort of maximum eastward extent. And then what happened is the slab either foundered, so it broke apart and sunk down into the mantle, or more likely it appears it sort of peeled back sort of back almost to like a normal position. And then eventually what happens is the San Andreas Fault uh, initiates and becomes a transform margin on the West Coast. And this, this we no longer have active subduction and the San Andreas Fault sort of continues to grow to this day. And that's why we only have a little bit of subduction up in the Pacific Northwest. So you can imagine that Pacific Northwest, it's the Juan de Fuca Plate and the Cascades are, that used to be the whole West Coast, but eventually that, that shut down. But anyway, the, the Important bit is that everything migrated to the east, and then all of a sudden that slab could no longer maintain that sort of low angle and it started to break up and sink, or more likely it started to peel, peel back. And when it did that, there was all this heat that came up from the mantle, sort of that was shielded, the, the upper plate was shielded from the mantle by this slab sort of slithering in between it. And then as that pulled away, all this mantle was able to fill in and heat up and there was another burst of magnetism associated with that. That's called the mid, it used to be called the mid tertiary ignimbrite flare up, now it's called the mid Cenozoic, which changed names. But anyway, it's a, ignimbrite is this word for this sort of eruptive event, lots of pyroclastic flows and volcanic rocks, and they blanket large parts of the Western US. And so shown here, I'll see if I can move this bar. Um, shown here in the colors on the map are these volcanic rocks associated with that. Um, and they end up, there's a progression of ages. So the figure on the right, you can see uh, the lines of the different numbers. Those are millions of years. So there's sort of a north to south progression. There's also an east to west progression. So the idea is as the slab was peeling back, there was this uh, burst of magnetism. I say burst, but it's over millions of years, geologic. Everything's fast forward in my mind, it happens, you know, things like this. 
Um, so we see these volcanic rocks getting younger to the south and to the west as that slab peels back. And here in Wyoming, the evidence of that event is the Absorca Mountains. So the Absorca Volcanics up in the Absorca Mountains, all of those are part of this ignimbrite, uh, ignimbrite flare-up and these volcanic rocks all over, all over the place. So that in a, so other things, the San Juans would be an example of that, the Marysville Volcanic Field in Utah, Mogollon de Teal Field in New Mexico, Sierra Madres in, in Mexico. So all of these uh, volcanic rocks all over the Western US are about 40 million to let's say 20, 20 million, 25 million, something like that. So during that time period, we had this other big magmatic event that was opposite of the first one was sweeping back to the so to sort of summarize how this, uh, how this works, this is a figure from a paper by Kurt Constinius where he had mapped out these ages of rocks. And this holds true for most of the Western US. Magmatism, continental arc magmatism swept eastward. So in this case, you can see things like Idaho Batholith, that's in Idaho, um, Bear Paw Mountains, Black Hills, moving to the east and then turning around and moving back to the west. So there's sort of this big, overall movement of arc magnetism, things sweeping to the east and then sweeping to the west. And for the time period that I'm interested in, that's, that's like the dominant paradigm, that's the history. That's what I, you know, we teach students about the history of the Cordillera. This was sort of what was going on mathematically at this time. The arc moved inward, the arc moved back outward. And then later we have these other events. You have things like the Yellowstone hotspot, you have Basin Range extension, basaltic dip of magnetism. But during this particular interval, say from 90 to, say uh, 40 MA, this was, this was what's happening magmatically with igneous rocks in the Western US. So this is where the story starts to change a little bit with this new research we're doing. So traditionally, this is what we think about. Okay, what happened with magmatic rocks, magnetic activity during this time period? But a lot of places you'll go in the, in the US Cordillera, Canadian Cordillera, Mexican Cordillera, you see the rocks kind of look like this. In particular, um, Talking about some of these, uh, this is a cliff face here. These uh, dikes and sills that are very light in colors, we call these Luca granites, would be the name Luca, meaning Greek word for, for white. Um, and these rocks are very different from those other rocks, but they also fall within the same, same time period. So, what we did is we sort of mapped out where these rocks were located. And we also started to map out their ages. I'll show you a, 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 a chart from the paper uh, later on. And we end up figuring out they occur in this belt that's shown in orange in this figure from the, from the paper. We called it the Cordilleran Anatectic Belt because these rocks ended up being formed by melting of the crust. So we showed the figure earlier with subduction, the continental arc, it's water being released in the mantle and then we're melting the mantle and the mantle melts are coming up to the crust. So in this case, we don't think there's any involvement with the mantle. It's all happening within the crust, which is melting the, the crust. Um, these rocks, they tend to be very white. Uh, they have, uh, it's mainly quartz and feldspar, in the case care about the mineralogy or not. But the uh, things like uh, mica's in there, biotite, muscovite, uh, and sometimes garnet as well. And that tells those minerals, tell us a little bit about the composition, tell us a little bit about the history that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, later. So the photo here is from the Snake Range in eastern Nevada, and it's, it's hard to tell because it's kind of small, but you can see these little, little white lines crossing across the cliff faces. This is often how it looks like. So one interesting thing about this magmatic event is there was no volcanoes. So continental arcs, we think, oh, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, there's volcan volcanism associated with this. This was all happening deeper in the crust, so happening maybe... Um, uh, 10, 15 kilometers down into the crust. The, the partial melting was going on, recreating these melts, creating these magmas, but it wasn't moving up to form volcanoes. Uh, okay, this would be really hard to talk to my own echo. I can hold a conversation with myself. You're wrong. You're wrong. So anyway, the, uh, a few interesting things about this. One, they dominantly occur within what we call the hinterland of the origin. That means like in the core of the mountain belt um, behind the severe thrust belt, which is sort of the frontal deformation front. So that's the red line of the triangles. That's the front of the, the thrust belt there. So you can see the orange belt dominantly occurs behind that. So that's fairly important. Another important thing is it dominantly occur associated with metamorphic core complexes. 
which I think I have a slide of, um, slide of in a second, but there's a close association between the two. And I'll talk about that, um, talk about that in a second. Um, the other thing is they have a very specific chemistry, very specific mineralogy, and also we look at their isotope chemistry. That's how we can really tell that they weren't forming from the mantle, that they were forming by melting existing rocks that were, that were in the crust. And uh, John, I think Carol's coming in a month or so, Dr. Carol Frost, to talk about the September to talk about the Tetons and uh, uh, melts there that happened 2.5, uh, 2.6 uh, billion years ago. So these are the same rocks, chemically, isotopically, but in their case, she's going to be talking about an ancient collision event that was probably analogous to like the Himalaya today. Uh, here I'm talking about the same compositional rocks, but not a collisional event. This is sort of a Cordilleran system, but same type of thing, crustal melting happening within, happening within the crust. So here, this is a picture of Mount Everest, but what I did is I took a picture of the Himalaya and I, that's the bottom picture there. And then on top of it, I put this Cordilleran, North American Cordilleran text belt. I, I adjusted it so that they're the same scale. So in the Himalaya, we have this thing called the Himalaya Luca granite belt, which essentially during collision, we had lots of this crustal melting and we find these, these Luca granites. And what's really interesting about the stuff in North America is normally we don't associate these rocks with Cordilleran systems, things like the Andes or things like Mount St. Helens. Normally when we see crustal melting, we think of big giant mountains that must have formed and these huge, really high temperatures in order to melt the rocks. So it makes sense to see them in the Tetons where we think we had this collisional giant mountain building event. It makes sense to see the Himalaya. We see them in some places like the Alps, some places like the Appalachian Mountains. We thought we had old continental collisions, but sort of a, a new idea that they might be formed in these ocean uh, continent subduction systems. So that in itself is kind of, kind of cool. And I think it's cool because it's potentially bigger than the Himalayan loop grant belt, which at least in the geology world is this cool, famous thing. So it's, hey, North America, bigger and better than Nepal or Bhutan or China, these other, these other places. So interesting, interesting stuff. But certainly, certainly worthy, worthy of study. So the blues in the top figure are the metamorphic core complexes. Um, which I'll talk about in a second. That's sort of where these rocks are found, like the actual outcrops. Uh, in the Tibetan example, the Himalayan example, those are the actual outcrops of the, of the rocks. So it's sort of the orange is kind of the general region or belt, the outline of where they occur, and the blue is sort of the specific locations there, if you wanted to go out and pick up a piece and, and see it. Oh, the reason I had Mount Everest up there is the top of Mount Everest is very famously made of sedimentary rocks, but uh, about a halfway down the photo there, you get into these high grade metamorphic rocks that you can find full of these dikes and sills and these, these Luca granites that are related to this, this event. So they're, they're all over the place. All right, so sort of to the, the good stuff, at least from my perspective is, so, okay, we found these rocks, we kind of mapped them out. We know a little bit about how old they are, what they're, they're, they're made of. What we're really wondering is, for at least what I'm wondering, some of the studies tectonics, and it's like, why, why are they there? Why do we have melting? What was happening that caused this to these rocks to these to form? And this, my research group and I come up, came up with sort of four ideas that we think might be plausible to explain them. I mean, I'll run through each of these in, in detail and see which ones you guys can, um, can vote, figure out which one. We, we don't know. We don't have an answer. So at the end of the story is I'm going to say, I don't know. We're still working on it some grad students working on this project, trying to sort it out. All right, so the first one I'm gonna talk about, uh, oh, I'm gonna talk about mantle heating first, but I was gonna give a quick petrology overview. Um, so this is just a plot of elevation versus temperature. You guys know as you go up in elevation, it's easier to boil water, it boils a lot as a lower temperature, and you can map that out, you know, it forms a nice little curve. So that's like a phase transition from how high you are versus the temperature of water boils. So rocks work exactly the same way. So we can, instead of elevation here, I have depth in the earth. So as you go up, you know, to Mount Everest, the atmospheric pressure is decreasing, less pressure, you know, the column air, easier to, to make that phase transition. So same thing in the earth. As we get closer to the surface of the earth, there's less pressure. In this case, it's easier to melt rocks. And we call that boundary the solidus, 
the solidus is the temperature at which a rock starts to partially melt. There's another line called the liquidus when it goes from partial melt to 100% melt, which we're not gonna, not gonna worry about. So anyway, above that line, rocks are melting. So that's the sort of the region we're really, really interested in. So the first possibility to explore is mantle heating. Um, so the idea here is that one way to melt a rock is just to increase the temperature. So that blue arrow down here in the bottom figure, that, that again, their solidus is their, the red line. One idea is all you gotta do is just add a bunch of heat when we melt the rocks. That's like the easiest one, to, easiest one to understand. So then the question becomes, how do we get heat? How do we add heat to create these, these melts to melt these rocks? So one possibility is that there was some sort of upwelling or something going on in the mantle that concentrate, like concentrated mantle flow at the base of the crust or base of the lithosphere that would add that, add that heat in. Trying to remember what I have in here because I'm not in presenter view. I forget what I was gonna say, that's okay. The, um, essentially there's a few reasons we don't really like this hypothesis. Um, one of them has to do with the composition of the rock. So if there's a lot of uh, mantle upwelling, usually there's some sort of geochemical signature or isotopic signature associated with the, the, the mantle. Um, so when we melt the mantle, we create basalts. When we melt the crust, we generally create granites or leucogranites. So like dark rocks versus, versus light rocks. So these blue dots here, uh, I won't go over the geochemistry too much, but they're very high silica content. So that's why they're white, it's because they're very uh, silicic or acidic if you took geology in the 70s. Um, <laughs> no, no offense. Um, so anyway, they're very silicic, these leucogranites. They also have very high aluminum. So the reason they have muscovite and biotite and garnet is because there's lots of aluminum. So those are all minerals that have lots of aluminum in there. Aluminum is an element that's very insoluble in water. And so it stays around after weathering. So bauxite is a mineral they mine for aluminum. They usually mine it in tropical areas like, like Haiti, the Dominican Republic, where we've had uh, the landscapes have been weathered for a very long time. Uh, and what's left behind, all the other minerals and elements get moved away during weathering, but the aluminum stays behind. So sedimentary rocks that have gone through like a weathering cycle are rich in aluminum, uh, the element in aluminum. And so when we see rocks like this that have these very aluminum rich mineral or very aluminous, then it tells us that they were melting from a source that was most likely a sedimentary type of source. So they weren't mantle rocks. They weren't even other igneous and metamorphic rocks. Most of these are melting sedimentary rocks, which is a very interesting uh, sort of thing. It tells us that they're crustal rocks. We don't have Sand, sedimentary rocks, mudstones and sandstones and things like that. We don't have those rocks in the, in the mantle. So, so that's aluminum saturation index. It's, it's sort of a, a way to look at the, uh, how much is aluminum in the rock. It's uh, technically what it's measuring is, is there more aluminum in the rock that can go into feldspars? It's sort of a technical way to look at it, like plasma. Horizontal is silica content, so it's a silica oxide, SiO2. Yeah. 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 yeah, so most of these rocks are above 70% SiO2. So they're very silicic. Yeah. Like a garden variety granite from the like Yosemite would be like 60 or 65. Yeah. A basalt might be 45, something like that, SiO2. Um, I'll mainly skip over this one, but this is sort of a complex discrimination diagram that people look at different elements. Um, but essentially it's just showing that these rocks are very different from our continental arc rocks. So we can look at their chemistry and we know that they're, they're very different, something, something else going on. And part of the reason I'm talking about mantle melting is that if we involve the mantle, we wouldn't expect these types of chemistries, we expect other types of minerals. We'd also expect maybe there'd be some basaltic dikes or some other material in there that would have lower SiO2. So these are all things we look at to say, okay, it doesn't look like there's any involvement of the, of the mantle. Um, I think this is where I was gonna tell you the little story about the minerals and the aluminum, but this is probably the type of rock that these form from. So this is a schist, a very shiny muscovite rich schist. Um, essentially, it started its life as a mudstone or a shale, something like that, and you know, 
buried down deep in the, in the crust and metamorphose into a schist. So we think most of these rocks are the protoliths. So what it's forming from is melting of something, something like this. Um, and in the part of the world that these are located in, there are a lot of these old sedimentary rocks, these Proterozoic sedimentary rocks, even old Paleozoic sedimentary rocks um, that are exposed in places like the Tetons and, and elsewhere, you can go see them. But we think they are down deep in the earth, buried in these are the type of sources where these are coming from. All right, where am I going with this? Oh, I know what I was gonna say. So this is sort of a schematic view of, I talked about normal angle subduction, the flat slab subduction. So one more reason which we don't really like the mantle idea is that these rocks all formed during the period of low angle or flat slab subduction. And so a lot of people think essentially that slab refrigerated the lithosphere. So you can think normally you go down into the mantle and you're getting hotter and hotter. And instead you're inserting this, it's still hot from, you know, our kitchen stove standards, but cold when you think of sort of earth temperatures, inserting this sort of low temperature slab beneath the crust. And it's sort of shielding the crust from the mantle, the convecting mantle down here. Does that sort of make sense? So this idea that everything was relatively cool at this point, relatively cool as we had this slab uh, inserted in beneath here. So thinking about, it doesn't really make sense that there was a lot of mantle coming up at this time. So this is when magnetism was shifting out to the east. So magnetism, had, the continental arc magnetism had gone from California, let's say all the way out to the Black Hills, and then back in Nevada, then we started generating these other type of, other type of, other types of melts. So it seems like more likely than not, the lithosphere was refrigerated by this low angle subduction. So that's another reason, not huge of the mantle. That's a good question. Uh, I'll repeat it for the Zoom audience, I guess, who I've been ignoring on the camera. But um, so that, this is why we have talks so I can see live people, not screens. But um, so the question was, was the rate of collision the same during the sort of Farallon flat slab period versus it was sort of normal subduction period? And the short answer is we don't know. So the Farallon plate itself was very sort of conjectural because it, it was subducted, it completely disappeared. There's no Farallon, well, the Juan de Fuca plate today is a remnant of the Farallon plate. Um, most of our information about the Farallon plate comes from plate reconstructions about things that are now located near Japan. So we can restore the oceanic seafloor and see where it went and try to track it. Um, so most of it is computer model based. I believe it slowed down during collision of that plate. So maybe there was some resisting forces, it was resisting subduction, but I'd have to go back and look at the, these plate model reconstructions. But they are, we don't have any direct information. It all comes from like reversing plate motion computer models. But I think the people who do that are, are pretty good at what they do. Um, Okay, so that was sort of the first hypothesis we wanted to consider. Maybe sort of mantle melting was added heat. Another way to add heat, again, not having to do anything fancy, just making things hotter, is through crustal thickening. Um, so this is sort of an a idea that's uh, pretty popular uh, for people who've looked at these rocks, and it makes sense in a lot of places. So I mentioned that this belt tends to occur behind the severe thrust front, behind that red line, west of that line. So that line is the deformation front. So west of that line, we've had uh, reverse belts and thrust belts stack up the crust and make it thicker and thicker. So the severe thrust belt, you know, by Kimmerer in Western Wyoming, that's part of this, this event. And there was lots of shortening associated with that, something like 300 plus kilometers of shortening. So that's enough that we can sort of stack things on and make the crust, crust really thick. The reason this happens is because radiogenic elements are concentrated in the upper part of the crust. So like say the middle to upper crust. So potassium, thorium, uranium, rubidium. Uh, and as these decay, they generate heat. And so if we thicken the crust, we create a, a larger column that has these elements in it. And so they can start to generate more, more heat. And so this has been modeled. And if you instantaneously thicken the crust, 
something like 40 or 50 million years after that, they'll start to get hot enough to melt, melt rocks. And so that roughly fits in with the timing, the severe thrust belt shortening event, the sort of, let's say, 120, uh, 120 million years, about 80 million years, and about 50 million years after that, give or take, that's when we start to see these, these rocks form. So that's a good, it's a good model, a good, a good idea for a possibility of how this might have happened. What's, go ahead. Why do you say that there's more of these elements in the upper crust? So, well, there's not, they're not like a higher concentration. It's just that you can imagine we have a crust that's say 30 kilometers thick and there's more in the upper half. If we make that 30, 60 kilometers, you double the thickness. Yeah, the concentration with any given area is the same, but the overall. No, no, yeah, yeah, exactly. Now they, there's, they stay there, it's just we just have more, uh, more of it. So they're contributing, the, they're, they're contributing heat, and that heat's diffusing throughout the crust. And so it's instead of having a, let's say, 10 kilometer heat source, we have a 20 kilometer heat source, something like that. But it does take a while. And what's, what I thought's kind of cool about this hypothesis is that even though these rocks are forming during the Laramide orogeny, they might owe their existence to a previous orogeny, the severe orogeny that happened 50 million years earlier. So it's like a delayed period reaction. So that's kind of a good idea, and it works well for a lot of the Cordillera, but it doesn't work well for the southern U.S. and Mexican Cordillera. So you'll see this red line, which is the front of the severe thrust belt, cuts off and kind of ends in southeastern uh, California. And a lot of people think that's where the severe thrust belt kind of terminates. It eventually kind of picks back up in Mexico. It's called, not called the severe anymore, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, so this is a, a figure from the paper on the top here that shows kind of what the severe thrust belt like in those blue colors. So all these low angle faults that are stacking things. In the Laramide, it's characterized by these high angle reverse faults. And it's, Laramide's really good at making mountains pop up, like the Wind River Mountains pop up, or Bighorn Mountains pop up. But it's not good at stacking things on top of each other to thicken the crust. So high angle faults, things can move up and down, but the overall thickness of the crust is not changing. Does that make sense? So geometrically, whereas you really need low angle faults to get things to stack up to cause, cause crustal thickening. So in say Arizona and uh, Sonora, uh, Chihuahua, New Mexico, we have Laramide style deformation, and not severe style deformation. So there's no good evidence that we thicken the crust in that, in that way. So it presents kind of this problem for this hypothesis. Um, if this is the mechanism that created this melting, at least that doesn't seem to work when we get down to the southern U.S. and into Sonora and into, into Mexico. So it doesn't mean there can't be different mechanisms in different places, but this is sort of a weakness of the, the model. This uh, on the, the bottom figure shows sort of what Laramide, you know, style deformation looks like. We call it Laramide style because all the mountains in the Laramide orogeny tend to form in that way, which is another mystery, why we have that style of, of deformation. Another talk. Okay, the, another one I'm gonna talk about is decompression melting. So we talked about an easy way to do this, just add heat and that creates melting. But another thing we can do is we can relieve the pressure. So you can see our solidus here, this, this red curve has a, a bend to it. As we go up to lower pressures or shallower depths, we don't have to heat the rocks up as much to melt them. So one way to do this is we don't have to add any heat at all. All we have to do is take a rock that was down in a deep crust bring it up to the surface and it could start to melt all on its own without adding more heat or things like that. So we call that decompression melting. We're reducing the pressure. I think it's the same if like um, uh, you, uh, what I'm thinking of. I was thinking like when you uh, take the pressure off of a pressurized water and it boils on its own just to like at room temperature. Yeah, even at like room temperature, if you go from like a compressed, you know, reduce that pressure. It's that, yeah, I don't probably don't know. What it's yeah, yeah, there you go. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. So same type of thing. We're reducing the pressure on these rocks. And this is where I mentioned these metamorphic core complexes come in. So a lot of these rocks we see in these metamorphic core complexes. And these core complexes are places that have undergone a lot of extension you know, the crust is getting pulled apart. And instead of forming high angle faults like the basin range and the Teton fault with the Tetons, 
forming these lower angle detachment faults and bringing these very deep, these rocks from uh, deep in the crust up to the surface. So this is sort of a schematic diagram showing how this, uh, how this might work, what this uh, looks like. Um, and there's a couple of possibilities here. One is these rocks are associated with this core complex because these things are brought to the surface. And another one is that we only seem to find these Luca granites, these melts deep in the crust. And a lot of places, the only chance we actually get to see deep in the crust are these core complexes because they bring the deep rocks up to the surface, uh, deep like metamorphic rocks. So it's a little bit unclear uh, if they're, the association is real or the association is just, well, the only place that we can see these is when we have deep exposures because we don't have volcanoes and things up, up near the surface. So uh, again, in some places this works, in some places this doesn't work. It seems to work really well in the northern part of the Cordillera, particularly up in British Columbia, uh, Idaho, Montana. So the black on the figure on the, oops, I'm sorry, did I do that? With the chat? Uh, okay. So the, the black uh, uh, polygons on here are these metamorphic core complexes. They're essentially mountain ranges. These are huge features that have been exhumed and they have these deep rocks associated with them. The red are more of these uh, the continental arc coastal baffles. Uh, the figure at the bottom is just an example. This is one in British Columbia called Chushwap Complex, uh, what they think this might, might look like. And the idea is as these rocks are being brought up to the surface, you can think that it's, it's rocks, but it's starting to partially melt, maybe even flowing. And so there might be sort of positive feedback. It starts to get this kind of mushy thing and it starts to rise up and it gets more and more melt, gets softer and softer, weaker and weaker. It might facilitate a sort of rise up to the surface. So the Main way we could test this is, go ahead. So there's three little cross sections there. Yeah. The lighter yellow is that part that's really melting and it's getting shredded up. I think the top one is being yeah. normal and then you start crusting it. And so it's all, yeah, all extensional. So the, the idea is, uh, well, this is not my figure, but the idea is the blue is sort of Parts of the crust we have regular faults, and, and then as you get down deep into the crust, you have shear zones instead of brittle faults. So instead of like a something sliding, it's sort of like taffy, taffy. Uh, but the idea is there's a continuous shear zone from the upper crust to the lower crust. I'm not sure what the light yellow is, to be honest. I'd have to go back and read the paper and pull this figure. Where you talk about these things forming because they're hot enough to melt. It's all oh, I Oh, I know the paper that this came from, sort of review paper, they weren't talking about crustal melting in that, in that particular case. So most of these, uh, well, I'll show you the next, the next slide. So the way we sort of tried to address this was look at the age. So we can date the rocks that melted, um, and we can also look at the timing of extension. You know, sure there are a variety of methods. And so that's what we tried to do here. So the purple colors here are this anatectic belt. And the bars are sort of the range of ages for rocks that have been dated. So some of these we dated ourselves. Some of these we compiled from the literature, from various studies. And then the orange and green colors are the either onset of exhumation or the onset of extension. So there's slightly different ways of measuring that. But it's basically when the mountain started extending and rising up. And what we see is up in sort of what we call the northern belt here. This would be the ones in Idaho, Montana, British Columbia. Is a very close association between when these core complexes were extending and forming and when these anatectic rocks were forming. So in that part of the world, this seems like a really good explanation. The ages all match up and this, okay, things were extending and things were rising up and decompressing and that's when the melts were formed. But that tends to fall apart as we move into the central belt. So that's getting down into sort of Southern Utah, I'm sorry, Southern Idaho, uh, Utah, Nevada, down into Arizona and, and so forth. So from that point on to the south, these ages are, are decoupled and that the extension and the core complex formation was much younger, up to maybe 40 million years younger than the timing of the melting. So again, it's a scenario where it seems like here's a hypothesis that works for part of the US, part of the, the Cordillera, but doesn't work for, work for all of it. It's also just really interesting to wonder why there's this, these variations. So the anatectic rocks look to be slightly older in the central part of the US. The Ruby Humboldt Snake Range, those are both in uh, eastern Nevada, um, and then become slightly younger to the north and south. 
So melting might have started sort of in the central US 10, 20 million years earlier than these other places and sort of migrated, migrated outward. Why that is, we don't, don't know. But we have some hypotheses I'll tell you over here, but don't really know. Not hypothesis, speculation. So that's the decompression hypothesis. The last one is water flux melting. So this I talked about continental arcs. So continental arcs form by water flux melting. They release the water, the water changes the melting temperature, and we can get this uh, melting to form. So that we talked about that in the mantle with continental arcs, but it could also happen in the crust. So again, here's our sort of solidus. And the idea is when we add water, we change that solidus. So the red one, sometimes we call the dry solidus. The blue one, we call the wet solidus. So just like you add salt to your driveway to melt the ice, it lowers the melting temperature of the ice. You can add water to rocks and it lowers the melting temperature of the rocks. So again, we don't have to add any more heat. We don't have to change the pressure through decompression. We just have to throw in some water and fluids and more generally. All right, I'm not going to go through this, but there's various geochemical ways that we can test to see if water was involved. And these are all based around different minerals melt at different temperatures and pressures and tend to melt with water and not melt with water. So we can look at the elements to try to figure out which minerals were melting. Um, and the lo long story short is that the geochemistry tends to not look like it's water uh, flux melting or water excess melting. It's generally inconsistent with that. But we think that might not exclude water flux melting. And part of the reason we think that is because we also can look at the temperature at which these rocks melted. So there's a, a few different methods that we, we use to determine that, which I won't, won't go over too much or at all, I guess. But the upshot is, is that a lot of these rocks look they're melting at relatively low temperatures in the terms in, in the world of igneous rocks. So we, a lot of times we think about the mantle and rocks forming beneath like Mount St. Helens, we're thinking like 1300 degrees Celsius, really high temperatures. A lot of these rocks were in the seven to 800 degrees Celsius, which is still extremely hot and would you know, burn you and everything else. But in the world of rocks melting, those are very low temperatures. So because we have such, oh, go ahead. That's a great question. We don't know. <laughs> well, in terms of like continental arcs, we know it's coming from hydrated oceanic crusts um, that then subducting and that water is eventually dehydrated. And a lot of it is, well, that's, that's where it's coming from. In this case, if it is water, we think it might be the same source from that Farallon plate that's kind of sort of going at a low <laughs> angle, but we're not, we're not entirely sure if it is water where it might be coming from. That's a great question. Normally, when we think of the deep crust, we don't think of fluids down there. We think it tends to be dry, um, not a lot of not a lot of water. Also, not a lot of porosity or anything. These are not these are not like a reservoir or something. This is like met, metamorphic rocks. So think, okay, there's not a lot of free fluid space or porosity or permeability or anything like that. Maybe there's permeability. Um, so anyway, we look at the temperatures, and one thing the temperatures tell us is that they're melting at really low temperatures, which is sort of odd. Um, so there's some temperature information on the figure at the left. The figure on the right is showing sort of that same solidus. I'm sorry, but I flipped it upside down. The pressure is increasing upwards instead of increasing downwards. But that water present solidus is the same as that blue line I showed in the other one. So you can see it goes down to lower temperatures at lower pressures. And then we have some different minerals on here and sort of the temperature at which these minerals can melt um, within the, the rock. And so it turns out if the temperature information is correct, it's really hard to get a lot of melting uh, just by uh, heat, adding heat. So we almost all have to have water flux melting to get large, large volumes. Um, and also the temperatures seem like they might be consistent with water flux melting. So one of the things we've done is gone around and looked at the volumes of melt created. So this is from the East Humboldt Mountains in Nevada. Not a great picture, but a lot of the, the things you see are these dikes over all over the place. People have gone through and actually estimated these volumes. And we think the volumes might be something like five kilometers of thickness added to the crust. So imagine inserting a dike that's on a 10 meters thick and then doing that enough times that you expand the crustal thickness by five kilometers. It's a huge, a huge volume of material. So there's whole mountain ranges made of these types, these types of rocks. So one of the things we've been trying to do is sort of work backwards and say, if we make this much volume of rock, 
and we partially melted something by 5% or 10%, how much stuff do we have to have originally? And it turns out if we want to do it by not having water, we have to have these huge volumes. They'll say, okay, the entire crust that was thickened, maybe it was 50 kilometers thick, all of that was melting at 10%, something like that. It turns out to be sort of un, unrealistic, ungeological. We know these are forming from these sedimentary rocks. The sedimentary rock layers aren't 60 kilometers thick. You know, they might be a, a kilometer thick at most, something like that, to cover these like schist layers. Um, so that's one reason to think, well, maybe water is involved because it's very easy to get these really high volumes of melt if we add a little bit of water. Because all of a sudden we can, instead of having to get up to 850 to start melting something, we start melting it immediately at say 650. And so if we're melting something at 750, it's a lot more percent melt. Uh, this is another example from the Catalina Mountains down in Arizona, in Tucson, where I did my, my dissertation work. But again, this is a giant sill in the, in the mountain. The whole thing is a Luca granite. It's 45 million years old. I um, mean, the whole mountain range is made of, made of these sills. And again, something like five kilometers of added thickness to the crust. So very large volumes. Information thinks that water might be involved. Um, I'll skip over this a little bit, but we did some modeling work looking at how much water you need to add in order to get a big increase in melting, and it turns out not, not very much, maybe a percent or so uh, free, free water. So it's not huge, we're not like flooding, flooding the lower crust. We're just adding just a little bit of water and that's enough to start generating these, these melts. Okay, so here's a little bit of speculation and sort of talking about your question. During the layer mitoraji, we had this low angle subduction of the plate. That's why magmatism was sort of moving out. But then after magnetism moved out and the slab was at the bottom of the, the bottom of the lithosphere, it could potentially be releasing fluids during that time. And there's some evidence to suggest that. There's some geophysical studies that have suggested there's those fluids released into the lithosphere. There's also xenoliths that have come up. Uh, so xenoliths are usually just a sort of volcanic rock and it pulls up pieces um, from the mantle or from the lower crust, uh, little chunks that get caught up when the, when the, the lava is moving up. Magmas are moving up. And so we can look at some of these lower crustal xenoliths, and a lot of them are filled with these hydrated minerals. So the water is not present as like real water. What happens is the water gets into the rock and the new mineral forms that incorporates the water, and that's how it's stable. It's not like you can bring out the bring out the rock or something. Um, and were you asking about the Colorado Plateau? Someone had a question about the Colorado Plateau. So one of the hot theories about why the Colorado plateau is so high today is that we hydrated the lithosphere and added this water and things that used to be minerals like garnet turn into minerals like mica which have a much lower density and so the overall density could cause everything to float higher. So that's a pretty hot theory in sort of the tectonics community today. So this idea that there was water somehow getting into the lithosphere is not totally out of the blue. There's these other, other xenolith studies, geophysical studies, it's just there might be some water getting, getting in there. So we think maybe it's plausible that a little water got in there and could help cause all this, all this melting. All right, so I think this maybe was sort of a summary slide, but this sort of shows, this is working sort of in the Southern US where a lot of my active research is um, these days. So I have some states down there for reference, California, Texas. So the pink colors, that's what we talked about. The arc moved out the Big Bend and the arc moved out back out to, uh, back out to California. And the green blob up there is showing these Luca granites, these anatectic mountains. And what I'm trying to just show here is that magnetism moved past out to Texas. And then while it was say New Mexico and Texas, back in Arizona and Sonora, California, we had this, this melting going on. So it's kind of an interesting scenario we have two types of magnetism from two different sources, one from the mantle, one from the crust forming at the same time. It's sort of this choreographed dance of things moving around and melting, uh, melting at different times. But it sort of fits within the right, uh, this right time frame. This was a period when there was low angle subduction, there was a slab beneath the lithosphere, possibly it could have been releasing, releasing water. So that's sort of one of our pet hypotheses. Um, but again, might not, might not work everywhere. All right, I think I was going to wrap it up there. I wanted to acknowledge folks who worked on this. This is a student of mine, Cody, uh, in a, a mountain range in Arizona. And then a co-author of mine, Dr. Simone Runyon, co-author on the paper. She's the economic geologist. I think she gave, she gave, she gave a Zoom talk. Yeah. Uh, she was also co-author on the paper. 
So a lot of this work was actually a course we taught two years ago, I think, I forget now, with graduate students, undergraduate students. And this is something uh, we could sort of wrap up during the pandemic where a lot of this was compiling old literature papers. We could go find some old paper where someone described a Luca granite in a mountain somewhere and had some chemistry data and we started to compile that and, and work with that. So this wasn't just me, it was a lot of my students and Dr. Runyon, Dr. Runyon as well. All right, that's it, that's the work. Thanks so much. Doug? Uh, Me neither. So in Asia, we got two of them. Right? And, uh, yeah. Here we have the plate that's now on the Pacific Coast. Yeah, North that's America. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Are they the North American plates or are the plates in the Pacific? Yeah, yeah. So, so the question was in the Cordillera here, we have the Pacific Plate going under North America. Why not North America under the Pacific? So, it has to do with density. So, the reason we have ocean, we have two different types of crust, two different types of lithosphere, continental and oceanic. And the reasons it's called oceanic is because there's oceans above it. And the reasons there's oceans above it is because it's riding lower in the mantle. So, you can think about an iceberg made of I was gonna say wood and ice, but I don't know which one would float higher. Oh, anyway, they're different densities, and so they ride higher in the mantle, float higher, so sort of isostatically. And so oceanic crust, which is made mainly of basaltic rocks and very dense rocks, rides lower, and because it's lower, water fills in and we have oceans. Continental crust, much less dense, it rides, rides higher. So the denser one is the one that sinks beneath the beneath the other one. So it depends on your reference frame. So a lot of times, so it's all it's all sort of relative. A lot of times we like to think about North America not moving at all. And it's also it turns out to be kind of difficult to measure plate rates. Absolutely, you have to use things like the stars, or we use things like hotspots and have to make assumptions that the hotspots aren't moving, which might be a big big assumption. Um, in general, though, the oceanic plates moving much faster. Um, and part of the reason of that is that the things driving a lot of that motion is the slab that's sinking. So there's different forces you know, related to plates, but there's a big heavy slab that's sinking down in the mantle. We call that slab pool. And that's thought to be the dominant force driving uh, plate motion. And so almost always oceanic plates are the ones that are moving much, much faster. So North America, absolute motion today, I forget, but something like 35 to 50 millimeters per year, you know, relative to the stars or the center of the earth or something. Whereas oceanic plate might be um, uh, 200 or 300, 400 millimeters per year. So much faster. Can you go back to the slide that had the big red thing on it? Thank you. Uh, you can go by Oh, this one, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here, right there. Oh. Right there. Yeah. Okay. Now, tell me when the San Andreas really kind of started moving north and cutting off. We still need to have a question. Okay. So the, the question here is when did the San Andreas start moving north or, or initiate? Right. So, so, at least in my mind, it's kind of like the Caroline plate got cut off. Yeah. Uh, whatever energy was coming out of the Pacific stopped. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So the San Andreas probably initiated around 30 million years ago. And so that's also when you can see this large sweep back to the west. And so I think your thinking is exactly right. Part of it, we think, is there was no longer any plate to subduct. All of a sudden, a, a transform fault initiated, and basically subduction stopped, and you just left with this big, heavy thing at the base of the crust. And it's slowly metamorphosing, turning to eclogite, becoming more and more dense, and that eventually peels off or falls down, depending on which sort of which sort of model you like. So yeah, that that's exactly right. So uh, San Andreas, maybe thirty, well, maybe slightly older, starts to initiate, starts to immediately grow. I'm not sure about the rate that it was uh, was growing. I have to, to look that up. And then eventually, 
the thinking is that probably also contributed to fascian and range extension, which is a little bit a little bit younger, which is slightly separate story from from this, but it's part of the Teton story. You know, because we no longer had a compressive margin; we had this sort of strike slip margin. So all the forces pushing on the margin, building these mountains, causing all the faulting, you know, that stopped. And part of it was uh, maybe it was slightly oblique extensional, and part of it we had this large topography, maybe origin of plateau like Altiplano, and it could no longer support that gravitationally since it started to pull, pull apart. So between those two forces, we think that's sort of the transition to, extinct, to extension. But yeah, that, that slab rollback event almost certainly related to the development of the sand drifts. Yeah. Are there, are there other things besides water that you uh, drop the temperature like Hydrogen sulfide or carbon dioxide? C yeah, CO2, uh, definitely. I don't know about hydrogen sulfide. There's probably not a lot of, lot, lot of that. We, I just say water to be general, but really we're thinking fluids. And the main ones are, usually it's not just water, it'd be more like a brine um, and CO2 as a fluid, li liquid CO2 essentially. So yeah. But, oh, I'm sorry. The, sorry. the question was, are there things besides just water that could lower the melting point of, of rocks? Water is probably the, the big one, you know, then exactly the composition of that water is uncertain. But what, between water and CO2, those are the two most important fluids. Yeah. yeah, in, you know, in the field, we usually say, not in the field, like outside, but within the academic circles, we usually just say fluids to be, not to be too specific, hedge our bets. We don't want to be wrong. So, yeah. a fair amount of carbon. When you start to put the nodes, yeah, so it's a question. So it's an oceanic plate, so it could have carbonates on it. It's a question about how much of it, how much was on there and how much um, got scraped off. So a lot of the sediments that were on the oceanic plate end up getting scraped off and formed what's today the coast ranges in California. It's Franciscan Melange, if you've heard, heard of that term before. So it's a big uncertainty, how much sediment went down the tubes, how much got scraped off, if there was a lot of carbon there. But um, not necessarily part of this story, but part of the arc history, there's been period, this is the other talk I was going to give. The, uh, there's been periods when there's more magnetism, less magnetism. It's kind of a mystery why that is in places like the Sierra Nevada. And people have suggested, perhaps when there was more magnetism, there's more things like carbonates getting involved with that. And it could have had CO2 changes, so like a period when more CO2 was coming out of volcanoes and could have had climatic effects. And had, um, not, not like modern paleo climate, but effective climate, you know, 80 million years ago, 90 million years ago. Um, uh, Jay, I, I have a few questions that have come in. So in one of your early slides, the magmatic arch takes a almost right angle turn and heads east at the north end of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, can you talk about what's going on there? Yeah, so, so a little earlier than this. It was one, it was one of your first three slides, I think. I think this is not the same one, but hopefully it shows it. So the red colors here are the, the continental uh, Cordier and Bathyllus. Is this what you're talking about? Uh, it was, I think your third slide maybe. And you had a, you, you traced out the magmatic arch and it was quite a bit further west. Uh, yes, exactly. And so at the north end of the Sierra Nevada, the your, your dashed line goes abruptly east for hundreds of miles before continuing straight north again. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So there, you, these are the large orange polygons, but there are also lots of little small ones that I didn't show, and it's more or less continuous. So part of the reason we think there's that jog and the position of the ancient arc is that we have created uh, a, a, another oceanic plateau called, called the Celestia terrain. So it was kind of like the Farallon plate. The, or the idea is that there was a, a sort of volcanic large igneous province like on Tong Java today or any of these other things. That in this case, instead of subducting beneath North America, sort of plowed into North America and created this sort of embayment. And so the idea is originally that 
orange polygons would have been maybe still sinuous, but slightly more linear. Um, but then we had this, we call it terrain, exotic terrain, suspect terrain that came in and was accreted and, and globbed on to, to North America. So that's part of the reason we have that, that embayment where it says Cascades are. So if we look, if I had a geologic map, you would see that there's a different rock type uh, throughout that region. That also happens to be where we have a lot of the Columbia River results. Um, so it's slightly obscured by that, but we do have basement exposures. Um, we can see that that's not North American, North American crust there. So that's the... And, and what would have been the, the approximate date on the accretion of that terrain? I, I, I'd have to look it up. I think the rocks themselves are Eocene, so maybe 50 million years old. So it does sort of fit in with some of the timing for some of these anectectic rocks. I hadn't thought about a potential connection there, but there was some sort of collision event. This, we sometimes call this like a soft collision because we don't think this was like forming Himalaya type mountains. We think it was sort of gently accreted onto the, onto the margin of North America. Um, but yeah, I believe, I believe that's about the age of that. I think both the, the age of the rocks as well as the collision event. I think that the, I'm not an expert on this particular thing, but I think the theory is that it formed sort of on in the ocean, ocean lithosphere and relatively quickly after it formed, it was accreted to the margin of North America. And that's sort of the whole history of North America. It's just repeated accretion events starting with, not starting with, but including the stuff Carol Frost we talked about, you know, two, two and a half billion years ago, continuing today. We stuck around long enough, something else would stick on to North America. Uh, so yeah. the flat subduction, uh, <clears throat> are there places in the world today where flat subduction is actually happening now as opposed to happening here uh, 60 million years ago? Yeah, absolutely. So the best modern analog is in South America, in a region called the Sierras Pampianas. Um, so the Sierras Pampianas are, are is a mountain range. It's just like the Wyoming. It's like the Laramie Mountains. So you have these high angle reverse faults, these basement uplifts. They're forming sort of in the interior of the plate. They're not on the margin. And there is a flat slab subduction. There's a few other places in the world as well. Mexico uh, is actually one beneath Mexico City is fairly flat slab. But people go to the Andes when they want to understand a modern analog for what happened in the um, in the U.S. And, and vice versa. We go to the Andes, the Chilean, Peruvian, Argentinian scientists. They come to the U.S. and study 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 our areas. But it appears to be almost an exact analog. The only difference is there's um, the flat slab segments in the Andes are thought to be an ancient spreading ridge is one of them. That's the Nazca Ridge. And the others, two flat sub segments. And the other one is thought to be an old hotspot track, something like this San Fernando Ridge, is something like the Hawaii hotspot track. Uh, so these are two features that are subducting. This is places where we have sort of abnormally thick oceanic crust, uh, maybe from a hotspot or maybe from an old spreading ridge. And they both have this low angle, low angle subduction. Also, we see that the volcanic arc shut down. Um, we don't see it move to the east like we think it did in the U.S. It seems like it's just shut, shut off. Um, um, so we see the same similar magmatic history, similar deformation history in terms of the mountains. In terms of Anatexas and the lower crust, that's something that I've often wondered about. If we see something in the U.S., this new idea that we can get crustal melting in these Cordilleran systems, perhaps we predict in the Andes today our modern Cordilleran, the best modern Cordilleran system, in the base of the Altiplano beneath Bolivia, maybe there's crustal melting going on deep in the deep in the crust. Um, but yeah, in terms of is there fluids getting released? Is there melting going on in the crust? That's really hard to evaluate geophysically sometimes, especially when there's also active volcanism in places like the Andes. So now what what might be crustal melting versus what might just be uh, normal magmatic volcanic activity going on? It's hard to distinguish. But maybe what's going on there. And could you just again review what you see as the causes for when a slab goes from 45 degrees to, to 10 degrees or five degrees? 
Yeah, so the, the main thing is it needs to become more buoyant. And so there's a few ways to do that. The easiest way to do that is have thicker crust. So normal oceanic crust is normally six or seven kilometers thick. Um, if we start doubling that or tripling that, all of a sudden we have a lot thicker crust and that's a lot more buoyant and less, uh, won't subduct to sort of a steep angle. So one way is to thicken the crust and usually with oceanic crust, the easiest way to do that is something like Hawaii with a, with a hot spot. We don't really have a lot of like mountain building type events going on with oceanic crust because um, it tends to subduct rather than build up like continental crust. Uh, the other possibility is to make it hotter. So if we make it hotter, it becomes less dense. You know, it expands when something is, is hotter and that'll also cause it to subduct at a lower angle. So if we're subducting in terms of when we think about temperatures and oceanic crust, we often think about the age. So we can think about it a spreading ridge, oceanic crust is zero, you know, was born today. And as you move away from a spreading ridge, it gets older and older. So if we're subducting something closer to a spreading ridge, the crust is younger and hence hotter and hence more buoyant. So it could be if we're subducting very young crust, we could be having something subduct at a lower angle. And the last possibility, which is a little more controversial, is if we're subducting at a very, very fast rate. Um, some modeling, this is all computer modeling, suggests that maybe that would be more likely to subduct at a low angle. But some people don't buy that and say, well, it could subduct fast at a, you know, at a regular angle. But those are the three main, I would say, mainstream hypotheses about how to change the, the angle of subduction. Somewhere underneath California, Arizona, is an old spreading summit that you don't want to eat on Yeah, so, so the question. Yeah, so the, the question was the map shown here, it has the, the it's called Florida plate, Juan de Fuca plate, and those black here, with my cursor. These dashed lines are transform faults, and these dark blue, dark uh, lines are uh, spreading centers. So that's where new crust is, is forming. And so the, the observation was that you can see that there was spreading centers that used to be where the San Andreas fault is now, which is this, this line here. So that we just subducted spreading centers not too long ago. And we continue to subduct spreading centers. So that's that's absolutely right. The reason we have a transform fault is because we subducted a spreading center and it changed the triple junction into a, a, a transform fault. Um, and so we call that a slab window or not, um, yeah, a slab, a slab window. So the idea is that the crust, you know, the spreading center continues the spread as it subducts, but then you're no longer creating new crust, just sort of like a hole opens up. So this like window opens up. And so that's seen actually all up and down the coast of California. And they can see because you're opening up that hole and there's mantle coming up that there's heat and that's causing the plate to be more buoyant. So there's an uplift signal in coastal California that they've actually been able to track that as, it moved, as it's moved northwards. The thermal signal that we're not sure how much further inland that, that extends. That's mainly limited to say 200 kilometers or so from the, from the San Andreas Fault. But there is abs that absolutely happens and there's uh, people have studied that and can see it migrate along with the, as the, as the fault continues to extend and get longer, it's getting longer faster than it's slipping, if that makes sense. But um, so the length is related to the plate rates. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, so that, that, is a, that is a signal. I'm not sure if that, perhaps that could reach as far inland as the sort of anatectic belt we're talking about. One of the things I always I wonder about is that we, there's this, you can go to like uh, Western Nevada and we don't, don't see this. So you go to Eastern Oregon, something like that. So it, it's, it's odd to me that it's this belt and not a big region. It seems like maybe there's something that's focusing it in this particular region, but I'm not really sure what what might be doing that. I mean, if it's releasing water, did it just release water there and not elsewhere? Um, maybe if this mantle upwelling, would, for some reason you'd have like a curtain of mantle upwelling in a particular uh, particular region, 
So don't, don't know, but it is interesting that it's not, I mean, it makes sense with the continental arc because we know okay, something's subducting and where the water is getting released, that's where the arc is. But in the case of this, we have these different hypotheses. I'm not sure the significance of that. It is interesting. Uh, so last question from, from me, Jay. On your very last slide, uh, you have someone pointing at what looks like a block of metamorphic rock in a sea of igneous rock. And uh, maybe you could just explain what they're pointing at. And uh, Sure. So it's, it's actually the opposite. It's pointing at an igneous rock in a sea of metamorphic rocks. Actually, no, this picture is all igneous rocks, to be honest. So this is um, in the Pinalenio Mountains in southern Arizona. It's one of these metamorphic core complexes, one of the lesser known ones. Um, this was a, a sort of a new discovery. The student here is working on writing up the paper. Um, the things that look like metamorphic rocks, it has a slight foliation, but it's a magmatic foliation. And the things that are white are these, these Luca granites, and they turn out to be all about the same age. Um, so this is a case where we have sort of a, looks like a pluton intruded. And that would be the dark, uh, dark colored rocks like here um, that have a lot of biotite in them, but are still relatively silicic. And then later on, they're intruded by all these uh, leucogranic dikes. But later on, we know it's later on because of the cross-cutting relationships. You can see one intruded the other. Um, but in terms of geochronology, we can't distinguish the ages. They all look like it happened within one or two million years. Um, so this was probably all just a single a uh, single event. But in general, this whole mountain range is made up of metamorphic rocks. These uh, uh, meso, the paleo, protozoic, 1.1 to, let's say, 1.6 billion year old rocks, um, gneisses and schists. And those are likely what was melting to form, form these rocks. So we've done some geochemical work. So this is sort of a case study we did on this sort of larger, larger theme. Yeah. I can't see the caption on this photograph, but he's pointing down and said, hey, I found your cell phone. <laughs> Did you hear that? He said, no. the cap he said, if there was a caption, it would be, hey, I found your cell phone. Actually, another student on this trip slipped and fell down a waterfall right there in the background, got soaking wet. It was also probably 100 degrees out, so it wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was lucky. Being All right, any more questions here? So no, that's a really common misconception. So a lot of, uh, and actually in many older textbooks, it's sort of shown wrong. So the question was, is the slab melting as it's is it going down in sort of a subduction scenario? So slab melting can occur, but we think it's a relatively rare occurrence. So what's really happening is water is coming off of the slab. Uh, so there's water was circulating through the crust and hydrating these minerals, creating things like serpentinite. And then as the crust is, as the slab is going down into the mantle, it's heating up and that water that bonded with the mineral now is no longer stable, it's getting released. And so it's the water that's coming off of the slab that's melting the overlying mantle rocks. The slab itself probably, it does melt in some cases, but it's probably a much uh, rarer scenario. But so, yeah, it, it did deeper as well, so further down. Also, any sediments that went down, those probably eventually melt as well. So there's slab melting, there's like sediments melting, but classic magnetism is mainly from the water, and all it's doing is changing the melting temperature and causing things to melt in the mantle. Yeah. You commented uh, in passing there that the downgoing slab had to be cool. And another question is, is if you're dealing with an oceanic slab that's trying to go down into the extinction, it must, must be much more dense. So how, how is it falling into something more dense? So, 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 yeah, so the, the question was, we mentioned some of the forces on plates. So this sort of stuff teaching like plate tectonics course. So there's different forces on plates, some resisting forces, some pulling forces, some pushing forces. 
And the question is about what about the force of the, the asthenospheric mantle sort of resisting the plate as it's, it's going down. So the plate actually becomes more dense than the asthenosphere as it gets older. Yeah, as it gets colder and older. So as it gets colder, it gets more dense. And the other thing that happens is the crust stays the same thickness, but tectonic plates are made up of the crust and something called the mantle lithosphere which I like to think of as like the, the frozen mantle. So there's part of the mantle that's convecting and moving, and there's a part that's stuck to the crust. We call it the mantle of the sphere, continental mantle sphere. Together, that's a tectonic plate. That's like the rigid part. And that mantle part actually grows over time. So it continues the cool, and the crust is just what was erupted at the surface. That's the six, seven kilometers. But over time, the mantle of the sphere gets thicker and thicker. And that's like very cold, dense prototype, essentially. Um, and so what happens is as that gets thicker and thicker, that's denser and denser than the hot convecting mantle, and it's cold. Um, and the other thing, as it starts to subduct, the basaltic crust turns to eclogite, which is like a pyroxene and garnet. It's a very, very dense rock, that much denser than mantle. So it actually, as it's subducting, it's getting even more and more dense. And so it's like a runaway. Run a, runaway type effect. Yeah. But new, new formed crust at a spreading center, there's zero mantle at the sphere, it's all crust, and that's much less dense. And so that doesn't want doesn't to subduct at all. You have to wait till you get, I mean, you can sort of force it to subduct, but yeah. So, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. So, so Jay, there's a, a great question, which is not exactly what you're talking about in your talk, but if, ocean crust generally subducts, then why do we see opholites all over the world? And can you talk about abduction, which I, is a whole other talk, I realize. No, so no, maybe, that's a, maybe that's a, a, a short a, answer to that. Sure, kudos to whoever asked this. So there's, so what opholites are is uh, essentially oceanic crust or oceanic crust and mantle that we can now see on the continents of so we can see some in Tibet. We can go look at that, the boundary between where India and Asia collided, and there's an opiolite, the Shigatsu opiolite. So, so we can go to the coast range in California, we can see something called the coast range of opiolite. So that's a great question. People have wondered this for a long time. Oceanic crust subducts, why, why, should we, why do we see it? What, what happens? So they're used to the ideas about sort of abduction, when things collided somehow, instead of going down, it got like shoved up on top. And people never really like this. So the most recent ideas have to do with the formation of core arcs during slab rollbacks. This is going to be a little bit complicated, but it's a great story. So the idea is there's, there's subduction going on, and that slab dip we talked about can change. So if the slab dip rolls back, pulls back, we don't just create like a hole in the earth, right? What happens is the rocks that were there start to extend and pull apart. And so you can actually create new oceanic crust from the extension during slab rollback, and that's in the upper plate. So as we're pulling apart, extending things, we keep pulling it apart, we pull it enough that mantle's coming up and forming new oceanic crust. And we call that the fore arc. So here's the arc over here as it's subducted. So there's a downgoing plate and an upper plate. Normally this is oceanic, this is continental. But if we have enough slab rollback and extension, we can create new crust up here oceanic crust. And then some other time, maybe that shallows and closes, and it's already in the upper plate. And so it's easy just to keep that from getting subducted. So a lot of the, the this is pretty modern thinking, to be honest, like these, these ideas last certainly within the last 10 years. A lot of people are going back to old ophiolites, like the one in California, the one in Tibet, and saying, hey, this isn't just normal oceanic crust. This is stuff that formed in the fore arc in the upper plate. So it's relatively easy to preserve. We don't have some weird geometric problem about stuff that was going down, getting it going on top. It was always up here. So it formed up here and then it closed up here and it just stayed, stayed in the upper plate. So that's kind of a, a cool new idea that's been uh, really taught in the tectonics world uh, lately. Great question. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very, a new explanation for me. So, so thank yeah. you. And, we have no further questions on our end with the chat. And, and I just wanna thank you from all the Zoom viewers for an excellent talk about a topic that uh, certainly many of us
did not know that much about. So my uh, pleasure. Thanks so much. We we, we really appreciate the whole regional overview. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you uh, from this end as well. And you know, we have a small uh, oh, thank you, John. thing to remind you of uh, having to come out here, hopefully. All right. Sure so. so thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Uh, and for those of you who are still there, do remember that in two weeks, we have Aaron Campbell, I'm State Geologic Survey Director and State Geologist here. So tune in for that. Thanks, Jay. Well, my pleasure.